So in this video, I'd like to make a, a sort of um, simple but important point about work, which is that in general, work depends on path. And not just on the endpoints of the path, but in general, work depends on the path that you take. And a sort of trivial example of that, but one that I'll spend a little bit of time on just to, to emphasize some points, is if I imagine I want to move from point A to point B, right? So let's say I've got a euro coin. I'm interested in how much work it's going to take me to move that from point A to point B. Uh, the answer to that is actually it depends, and it depends on how I choose to get there. Like if I do this, that takes less work than doing this, which in turn takes less work than... You know, doing that. I mean, all of those are ways to get from point A to point B. All of them are going to involve different work on my part. So, pretty clearly, in general, work depends on path. I want to actually work through that example a little bit just to illustrate how you can actually choose a path to do work. So, let's actually think about those different cases. So, I'm going to actually, let's say this is my coordinate system. So that's the x-axis, that's the y-axis, and so point B, I'll say, is at um, plus r, and point A is at minus r, right? So one path I could take is this path that goes right along the y-axis, right? Let's call that path number one. A second path I could take is one where I actually start out at point A and follow a semicircle to get up to point B, right? That's path number two. Um, you know, I could also choose to do this. I could move out here and then up and then over, right? That's path number three. And I could do something else much more complicated if I wanted to, but I don't think I'll do that for the sake of um, not making life too complex, right? So if I think about what the work is for path number one, well, what forces am I applying to this coin? I mean, pretty clearly, if I sort of draw it from the side down, right, there's my sort of finger being pushing down on the coin. So there, I am applying a force down on the coin. That in turn means that there is a normal force up that's greater than gravity, right? And there's a gravitational force that's acting down. The amount of force that I'm applying down on the coin plus gravity have to equal the normal force. And I'm also presumably applying a force forward on the, on the coin. And since I'm rubbing it against the table, there is a frictional force backwards, which is going to be pretty similar to the force that I'm applying to the extent that when I'm moving it, and pretty much moving it to constant velocity, which suggests that frictional force has to be equal to the horizontal force that I'm applying, right? But in any case, I'll certainly propose that I'm just applying some force me, right? Let's just call it force me and not worry too much about how big it is. Uh, let's do think a little bit about what the direction is. It always has a direction that's into the, an amount a component into the page. And then it always has a direction that's actually in the direction that I'm trying to move the coin. So when I'm moving it along this line, it's got a component that points that way. When I'm moving it along the circle, it's pretty much along the circle and so on. So now if I try to calculate the work to go from A to B, B via path one, that's done by force me, I take the integral from point A to point B along path number one. The force that I apply dotted with a differential chunk of that path, right? And if I think about what a differential chunk of that path is for this path, dx, is, dx vector is pretty easy to define. It's just going to be dy times j hat, right? If I think about integrating from y is equal to minus r to y is equal to r, right? Each little differential y in the j-hat direction is one little chunk of the path, right? The force that I'm applying is going to be basically, if I say that this has a sort of horizontal component, let's say this is f me horizontal, is the component that's in the direction of motion, this will be f me horizontal in the j-hat direction, right? Because I'm going to be pushing it up. So for path number one, I'm simply going to get the integral from minus r to r of f me times dy, because j hat dot j hat is 1, or 2 times r times f me. Right? If we do option number 2 along the semicircle, well, the work along the semicircle is going to be the integral from a to b along path number 2. right? 
Well, for path number two, I still have f me dot dx vector, but dx vector now is actually this little vector. It's that little chunk of the path. And probably the easiest way to think about that is to imagine that I'm changing what my theta value is as I move along a path. As I change my theta value, if I change theta by an amount d theta, this little length is the radius times d theta, right? Because if I make the radius bigger, pretty clearly the slice of that, the, the length of the arc increases, right? So this length is greater than that length. The length here has to do with what this d theta is. So dx in this vector is simply going to be r times d theta times theta hat, right? The force that I'm applying, again, it'll only be, I'm not gonna worry about the vertical force because that's not going to do any work since it's perpendicular to the path, but the horizontal component is gonna be parallel to the path. So that's f me h in the theta hat direction, right? I'm integrating from theta equals minus pi over two to theta equals pi over two. And so now when I do this integral, I get pi times r times f me. So as you can see, two is not the same as pi. The amount of work that it takes to go from point A to point B depends on what the path is. And we've also sort of seen an example in this of how we take and can think about a path and think about how to write a differential chunk of that path in a coordinate system.